somebody told me that I forgot Jiminu here here when I was copying the quadratic term terms here also because there is Jiminu times the quadratic terms in gamma so I forgot to contract the two indices with Jiminu let's check it because otherwise they are not contracted <coughs> so this is the gamma gamma action with of course gamma function of g given by the levi civita connection so we have <coughs> defined the so this thing <coughs> This functional derivative is t mu nu basically, apart from a square root of minus g and a half. So let us just uh, replace it. Uh, here I have to complete this thing to write the variation. The variation will be the variation, uh, whatever it is. So it is square root, it's uh, the integral of d4x square root of minus g and then this thing that we call the functional derivative times delta g mu nu with upper indices but <coughs> we can replace the functional derivatives with t mu nu and that will give the, uh, the field equation so let us collect 1 divided by 2k squared the integral of d4x the square root of minus g the variation of g mu nu and that multiplies what? <coughs> r mu nu minus 1 half g mu nu r minus lambda g mu nu and then um, I have uh, collected 1 divided by 2k squared and minus so I said minus 2k squared And then delta is m divided by delta g mu nu is square root of minus g, which is already out. So square root of minus g, and divide by 2. So there is a factor 2. So that is a t mu nu with lower indices correctly. That's it. So that is the field equation. with Timuno defined as we defined it previously. Okay, so these are the field equations. And then you have to couple to them the equations of the metal fields obtained by varying the action with respect to the metal fields, whatever they are. Now with fermions we cannot do this because with fermions we have to um, we cannot just use the metric. So when you have fermions let us define this object which is with one upper space-time index and a lower flat space 
index, 1 divided by e, and that will be the functional derivative of the matter action with respect to the field by. 1 divided by e is again 1 divided by the square root of minus g. There is no factor 2 now because e is the square root of g minu, but this corresponds if we apply this definition in case uh, if Sm just depends on the metric and not on the field by, this is the previous definition. What we, do we have in that case? If it just depends on the metric, let me write this as 1 divided by the square root of minus g, and then I can write that derivative as the derivative with respect to the metric times the derivative of the metric with respect to the field by. And we know how to do both. We know what this is because <coughs> actually what this is. <coughs> Let's see what it was. Uh, with minus, actually, because the lower indices, that's one half t mu nu with upper indices. One half t mu nu, uh, t rho sigma. And then we have to differentiate g rho sigma, which is, we know what it is. With respect to the field line. Due to the symmetry in rho and sigma, because this one is symmetric. So due to the symmetry in rho and sigma, we, we can differ, uh, differentiate the first and uh, then we will drop the factor 2. Or the last one. Let's differentiate the last one for convenience. Eta BC. What is the derivative of a field by respect to the field by? That's a delta function because it's, it's unity. Delta C A delta sigma no. And uh, that is what? T rho sigma E rho B, but B is equal to um, B, let's say B, eta AB and sigma is equal to mu. So you see that it is uh, precisely what you expect, namely that t has the same upper index mu, and the other one is lowered by means of the field line. So that index is <coughs> converted, actually it's not lowered, it's lowered and converted, it's two things, lowered and converted into a flat space index, which is what you can do with the field bank and the flat space metric. So, yes, the two um, definitions match, but uh, um, yeah, if you want, you can write in this case t a mu e a nu if you want if you multiply by a nu this is the metric that's uh, that's how you can see that the two match
Sometimes we also we may also use objects like this e mu a. I don't know if I already used those to to denote uh, the same here, for example. This could be written e rho a. Sometimes you find it have to get used to this uh, because. At the, at the beginning it may be confusing, but then when you see that everything works, it's not. So to work out the field equations of the fermions, we have to go back to the Palatini action. And uh, let's see when it was. Mm -hmm. Here it is. <clears throat> uh, so the variation of the Palatini action, let's recall we had this definition, delta EC is a matrix A times E terms of uh, forms, and then we had this variation of the Palatini action, to which we have to add the other one, the term with the meta, the meta contribution. So we define delta E mu A equal to some matrix E B mu. We recall what the Palatini action is actually, so maybe because now we have to couple it to matter. And actually I don't even remember the coefficient of the cosmological part and I think we have the cosmological part also here. plus SN. Uh, yes, we have the cosmological term to add. That's easy because R goes into the same as in the action. If you don't remember, the, re remember that it is exactly the same because it is a, it comes from the variation of a square root of minus g. So everything that multiplies square root of minus g remains the same. This comes from the variation of square root of minus g. So then you have the integral d4x delta e, whatever it is, delta sm delta e. And uh, this thing is equal to the integral d4x some a, a, b, e, b mu. And this delta, this functional derivative, can be replaced by 
T mu A with minus E. T mu A. So we collect minus 1 over k squared, integral over m, e, d for x, a, b, a, we have to change indices there, and then we get r, a, b. Remember that this r with two flat space indices is the, is the rigid tensor with converted indices. It's not the curvature form, which is a two form. This is a zero form. So. <coughs> so minus E is collected already, so we need a K squared and exchanging the two indices, the name of the two indices Um, minus uh, so um, let me see To multiply by this, there is a minus sign. That is not right. So we should have this, yes. And instead we have uh, here minus E <coughs> So, um, yes, it should be like that Probably this sign. Has anyone checked that sign? We can go back and check. I thought it was. Uh, let me check. Yes, that sign was not correct. Now I, I see on the other notes. The sign was not correct. Let's see why or what did we do here. So the Palatine action has a plus in front, that is uh, okay. And uh, <coughs> the variation probably comes later. No, there was no minus sign. I don't know why they wrote a minus sign. Here it is, the values. There is no minus sign. I don't know why I wrote a minus sign there. No minus sign. So everything is okay. Here you have plus. So that is a field equation that is equal to zero. Let's 
let us lower all the indices TAB where TAB is this T mu A E mu B and since T mu A is that we have minus 1 divided by E E mu B delta SM delta E mu E A now, this is a stress tensor, or what, uh, to what extent is it? Um, so remember again, this is in flat space indices. It is, however, the Ricci tensor is not the curvature. The notation is like that, so you have two, two options. And uh, when you don't know, you understand from the context which is which. Now, is this a stress tensor? Is this, for example, symmetric? No, this is not symmetric. Off shell, but it is on shell, which means if you use the field equations on the solutions, the space of solutions of the field equations, it's symmetric. How can you see it? Well, the first argument is from here. This is a field equation, and it implies that T is symmetric because the left hand side is symmetric, eta b is symmetric, eta b is symmetric, and I re repeat this is the Ricci tensor, so it is symmetric. So the first argument why this is symmetric is that. But there is a more subtle, um, maybe more instructive argument that we now see, uh, and uh, that is important, it is important to know that in the end you do have a stress tensor which is symmetric which we can uh, define as TAB up but on the solutions of the field equation so you can use this even if it is not manifestly symmetric it is when you use the field equations why because there is a theorem it's very important that says that <clears throat> The theory admits a symmetric tensor, which we can call stress energy tensor. So the theory admits, I would not know how to call it if it's not symmetric, so maybe it's not even right to call it a stress energy tensor, but let's see, admits. a symmetric energy momentum tensor um, oh yeah it can be defined as an energy momentum tensor even if it is not symmetric we will see uh, what it was in a moment by the theorem itself so the theory admits a symmetric energy momentum tensor On the so on, in the space in the space of solution on the solutions of the field equations if and only, only if it's Lorentz invariant. Not necessarily locally. In our case, it will be locally, but globally, which implies locally, Lorentz invariant. Right. 
So can we speak about this, an energy momentum tensor when the theory is not Lorentz invariant? Yes, because remember that the Lorentz uh, uh, the energy momentum tensor is another current associated with translations. And as long as the theory is invariant under translations, not necessarily Lorentz invariant, you can always speak about a stress tensor, an energy momentum tensor. So that is how you define, not as we define it. In case of gravity, we can use this shortcut here because we are already assuming this. We have the metric, we have the invariance and everything else. Otherwise, this is not the most general way to define an energy momentum tensor because it is associated with invariance and the translations. <coughs> not necessarily Lorentz invariant. If the theory is Lorentz invariant and invariant under translations, then it admits a symmetric energy momentum tensor. And if it is, and vice versa, if it is Lorentz, uh, if it is uh, invariant under translations and uh, has a symmetric energy momentum tensor, then you can build, explicitly build, the generators of the Lorentz group and check that the theory is Lorentz invariant. We won't have time to go through all these, but I hope in some, other, in some other courses you will see this playing with currents and the generators of symmetries. So it's important to have a Lorentz symmetric tensor and know this theorem because uh, if, uh, if not, uh, we would not have uh, Lorentz invariance. But here we do. And uh, another way to prove that uh, TAB is symmetric on the solutions of the field equations in the presence of fermions is as follows. Let us make a local Lorentz transformation and use the fact that SM is Lorentz invariant, SM is invariant. So, for example, it can be the Dirac action, uh, the, yes, the covariantized Dirac action, we know. We don't need to write SM explicitly for this argument, it's very general. SN is invariant under local Lorentz transformations. We will also we will only use that it is invariant under global Lorentz transformation, but we know that it is invariant under local Lorentz transformation. So for the moment, let's consider a generic infinitesimal local or global, we will see in a moment, uh, Lorentz transformation. We know that these parameters theta are anti-symmetric. Every other field will have a certain transformation, matter field, let's say. Fermion scalars, delta chi will be equal to something. Let me write it like this. will be linear in theta AB and uh, whatever it is. This coefficient A will depend on the fields themselves. Normally it is very simple. It's linear in the fields also, but it doesn't really care. We don't really care. Now let's make a uh, an infinitesimal variation of the action which is zero because it is symmetric. So that is necessarily zero. And that will be equal to what? We have a contribution that is <coughs> the variation 
with respect to the feedback. And contributions, which will be the variation with respect to the meta fields. Delta chi. Now we replace delta theta chi. It's not a generic variation, it's a symmetry variation. And so we know that this delta s is zero without using the field equations. That's the point of asymmetry. And that this, which is not the generic variation, particular variation, this the action is variation of the action is zero without using the field equations. So that is d for x integral. Delta theta is theta a b e mu b and this delta sm we can replace as we know by what? Minus e this t. So there is a minus e And some t mu e plus some okay, delta sm delta chi a a b chi theta a b now this must be zero for every theta a b. For the moment, let us assume that theta a b is, <coughs> we are using the fact that S m is invariant under local Lorentz transformations, so we can make a uh, theta a b uh, arbitrary functions of x. Then we will comment about the, the invariance under only local um, global Lorentz transformation. But for the moment, in gravity, you have necessarily invariance under local Lorentz transformations. So if that is zero, you can conclude that is zero what? Now, this object here is what we call TAB. Observe that TAB multiplies theta AB, and theta AB is anti symmetric. So you might as well put here the anti symmetric part of the TAB because the symmetric part disappears. So when you drop theta AB, you will have something like this. The anti-symmetric part of TAB is proportional. We don't even care about the coefficients, but if you want, you can put the coefficients. So plus 1 over E. Why not? Let's put the coefficients. 1 over E. Sum respect to over chi delta sm delta chi, and then again, since we drop theta, we have to take that co those coefficients to the anti symmetric, but this doesn't matter. This is an identity that tells you that the anti symmetric part of T vanishes on shell because those are the field equations of the matter fields. So zero on shell. Now, we have used the fact that uh, theta AB was a function of x because when we want to go from here to from here to here 
to this is in parentheses. We want to drop theta b. What happens when you have that theta b is not arbitrary, an arbitrary function, uh, but just a function, a, an arbitrary matrix of constants? That, in addition, uh, you may have to to have uh, a total derivative here. But you might remember that the stress tensor itself is defined up to total derivatives, improvement terms. Don't know if you ever ever heard about those. Even when you derive the stress tensor by means of another procedure, you do not get a, in an ambiguous answer. You can always. So when you, the theorem says there exists, the theorem admits, a, and that means that after you add, you do everything you can. <laughs> including adding total derivatives, so-called improvement terms, you will find it if and only if the theory is symmetric. Hmm? The theory is Lorentz invariant. So it doesn't need to be necessarily what we have written. It might have to be improved by means of total derivative, but still it will exist and be symmetric if and only if. We think that these things are very instructive because we are starting applying everything we have learned so far, which was a bit technical, but you uh, can now appreciate, I think, that uh, it leads to very profound uh, um, things. And it will be even better as long as we go move forward. Another... Um, fact that we did not mention earlier, maybe we should have mentioned it earlier, this here. Um, if we apply to the field here, the, um, if we take the covariant derivative, del mu of both terms, we find del mu or del um, with upper index, we find that the stress tensor is covariantly constant in the indices, space time indices. Why? Because <coughs> um, Maybe we can take a little, do it more detail. Uh, well, we can add a new slide here, right here, so we can do it here. As I forgot to, to say it earlier. So, T mu nu is covariantly constant on the solutions of the field equations against it. which means this. Because g minu is covariantly constant, so if we uh, apply del mu, we do not need to, to differentiate that, those things, the metric. And because of the contracted Bianchi identity, which you might remember, there is an identity that says this. Okay. 
And so when you uh, apply del mu here, by the way, this thing is called Einstein tensor. Maybe it's worth to mention it. It's denoted with big G. And that is also covariantly constant. by the contracted, second contracted, I don't know if it has a specific name, the contracted Bianca identity. So this is zero. Um, is there a stress tensor for gravity? No, not really. It's hard to define a stress tensor for gravity. Uh, because if you try, for example, and derive and, differ, and make this apply this formula to the entire action S, not just to the matter part, and define the total stress tensor of matter and gravity, you get zero on Shell, because that's the field equation of the metric. So if, if you drop M, this will be zero on Shell. So on Shell, uh, you don't have a stress tensor for gravity that is covariant, at least. And one has to define energy for gravity in a non-covariant way, which is, by the way, reasonable because the notion of energy cannot be covariant. In, even in special relativity, energy has to be part of something. Um, and, uh, but in gravity, the problem of energy, of defining the energy, is a little bit worse than that. And... Uh, I don't think that to, uh, this year we will have time to, to deal with this, but uh, uh, there is, uh, it has been studied, and I also think that the solution has been found, it's not even definite, definitive, and, uh, but it can be done, and to some extent it can be, uh, it is possible to define a, a, an energy for the gravitational field, non-covariant, gauge dependent, very, very special, that is, however, positive. There is a positivity theorem for the energy, not sufficiently general and uh, with some limitations. The problem is still open. <laughs>